for joining us for the last of our training evenings. And tonight we're looking at delivering a talk. Over the last few weeks, we've thought about you know, how to unpack the Bible passage, how to write your talk from scratch. But today we're going to think about how to communicate it. And I'm here with Alice Whitaker, uh, Head of Kids Ministry at St. James Musborough Hill. And uh, together we're going to be talking us through it a bit and hopefully doing some practical things as well. Uh, before we do that, shall I lead us in a prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of sharing it with children. And Lord, we pray that you would help uh, equip us tonight and encourage us to take that seriously and to give our best in engaging children with your word, that we might speak it clearly and communicate it well, that children might know you better and come to trust in you through through the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I guess we've all seen talks done well and some talks not done so well. Uh, we thought we'd have a go at demonstrating a not so good talk so that we can go on to think about what's a good talk. And uh, have a watch of this and see if you can spot some things and be thinking in your head of all sorts of things that you shouldn't do in a talk, as demonstrated by her able teacher, Alex. Good evening. Okay. We're going to play powerful versus powerless game. Okay. Who's more powerful? Child or a head teacher. Okay. It's more powerful. Okay. Hey. Uh, a bus driver. Oh, oops. My bad. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait. Who's more powerful? Uh, uh, Like the people, like like in the Bible, like story, but like good thing, like that they were with someone powerful. The disciples. The disciples were powerless. Jesus and his disciples were in a boat and suddenly there was a terrible storm. Some of Jesus' friends were fishermen. They knew that they were doing Jesus' friends thought they were like like were like like going like to die, like playing like the perfect storm like pictures that is like would have been like 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 They sold, they sold them into slavery. Oh wait, that's the wrong talk. 
Okay, she was a bit disorganised. Hi. <laughs> yes, yeah, disorganised. Well, but basically, yeah. she was a bit of a mess. <laughs> yeah, she, she definitely didn't look like she had planned. She, Very good she, actress, by the way. I give you that. <laughs> good acting. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. It's yeah, quite hard to do I things mean, badly. Obviously, obviously do nothing in order. Yeah, you hadn't anything sorted out. I mean, obviously, it was a yeah. So I mean. Yeah, so you had nothing in order, nothing was, you know, like arranged. Yeah, it's a total mess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, there was no eye contact. I don't think you ever looked at no. the audience. <laughs> at the audience, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, either looking at her notes or looking at the visual aids or on the board. Rather too many likes. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, and fillers in general, so lots of arms, lots of likes, um, just while she's finding the words to say, she wasn't really fluent, mm. perhaps a sign of under-practicing, or just a bad habit. Yeah. <laughs> what about the use of visual aids, because um, she had thought about using some visual aids, but were they helpful in this case? Well, personally, I couldn't see them. I think they were too far away. Yeah, they were too small. So yeah. that's the first yeah. thing. They were too small for the size of the space that was being used. I don't think the engagement with the visual aids, there was much as in terms of, okay, yeah, they were put on the, uh, the whiteboard and, and it was asked, but there wasn't really like a, oh, okay, actually looking at the children and asking them the question and waiting for a response and then giving them time to look at the visual aids. It was just like, okay, let's move on. <laughs> exactly. They were pretty pointless. She didn't make much use of them and they weren't adding anything to what she was doing. She could have just said the words without particularly putting them up. And in fact, it was distracting because half of them didn't stick. They weren't up for long enough and they slowed her pace down too much. So every time she was trying to stick them up, the talk had to slow down. We were sitting and waiting. So if anything, it was a distraction rather than an aid. Anything else? Was there anything else, Alice, that you thought? Well, I had, I had another talk as well. And so I got my talks <laughs> mixed up. Oh, yeah, you got them mixed up. Some... Mm. So that was perhaps your lack of organisation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pointed it out. But... And then dropping them and not really knowing which order they went in as well. So, yeah. Great. Well, we all know how to recognise a talk well done, something that's really engaging and something that's not because most of us have had to listen to speakers week in week out for a long time and you can probably think of other things that speakers do that alice didn't do there that makes it difficult to hear them or engage with them or to carry on listening to them perhaps the person that paces up and down uh, i find that very distracting the person that mumbles under their breath and you can't quite hear what they're saying 
or even the other extreme, the person that's too shrill <laughs> and difficult to listen to. So we're going to go through some of the things that make your talk engaging this evening. And hopefully you've got a copy of the handout. You can follow those things through. So we first think about making sure your voice is audible and that you are visible. Yeah, so first you want to think, can the children hear you? Um, basically, can they hear you? So it depends on the space you're in. If you're in a little space, maybe you can talk. Um, you don't have to talk super loud. Whereas if you're in a really big church or in a big school hall, you're going to want to project a lot more. Um, and I think you're also going to want to think how you can change your voice up. So not just kind of staying monotone and just kind of boring people in that way, but changing it up depending on what you're saying. Um, and you're also going to want to make sure that you're visible. So if there's a pillar, there's a pillar in this church, um, then you want to make sure there aren't children hiding behind the pillar. You want to make sure they can see you because probably if they can't see you, they're probably going to be fidgeting with something or it's going to be harder for them to focus. Um, also, another thing is not if you're reading straight from your script, it's not going to be as engaging as if you are speaking to them. Uh, the eye contact really, really helps. So what's really helpful is if you kind of, you learn a lot of your script or you learn the structure and then you talk. So maybe you look at your script and you think, okay, that's the point and now I'm going to speak about it. Uh, just so that you're more engaging. And also think about the way that the kids are facing. Uh, you don't want the kids facing another direction if you're, you want them looking at you. So just make sure you sit kids in that way so that they can see you. And also think about what's behind you. Because if you have, say, a big window behind you, kids are just going to be watching out the window. They're going to be watching the cars go by, watching, I don't know, the birds, watching people uh, playing music outside. Uh, so just really think through how you place the kids so that they're not distracted. Okay, so what we're going to do now is there are three scenarios on the sheet. I'm going to read them out and then can we put people in breakout rooms? Or room. Okay, if you're in one room. Okay, so the three scenarios are scenario one, there's something distracting happening outside the large window behind where you usually stand to give your talk. The blinds don't seem to be functioning. Scenario two, you have a child with ADHD and four four-year-olds in the, your four to 11s group. It's clear they will struggle to be attentive and distract the other children. And scenario three, you're in a big school hall that has a noisy hum from a fan and the canteen is noisily preparing meals next door. There is no working microphone available. So what I want you to do is choose one of those scenarios and talk about what you would do in that scenario. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. You can probably unmute and share your ideas with the people in the room, Rebecca or Cara. Want to? It's just the two of us, right? Yeah, just <laughs> two online. How many? How many are there with you? Uh, oh. just Tim, Mark, and Mandy, Alice, and I. So five of us. Oh, okay. There. Hello there. Hi. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, if there's a large window, I'd probably turn it around so they can't see out the window. <laughs> yes, what, what's your solution to, to the distracting window? I said I would turn them around. Turn the children around, yeah, to face a different direction. Yeah. That's the obvious solution. Uh, 
let's see. What about the second of the um, scenarios? How would you try to have those children where you've got four or four year olds, child with ADHD, might be distracting for the other children? How would you seat them or arrange them? Well, sometimes it's good if they sit in the back so they're not such a distraction or they use a lot of TPR so that they have a lot to do and can keep concentrated. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a sensible idea perhaps if they've got if they've got an activity or something then put them further back where the other children are not going to be distracted by whatever they're using the fidget toys or whatever it might be and the third scenario That was the noisy room, so we've got the canteen and the hum of the fans. Quite a tricky one though, if you know you've not got any. Do you just speak louder so it compete with the noise or do you try and do something different? I think you could at least put them in a circle, say, so that you know, you've know you got your closest to as many of them as possible. Mm. Um, so if you've got a small number of children, try and minimize the distance between you and them so they can hear more easily. Get the phone. I would, I would, yeah, I would have said put them, not, <laughs> not exactly in one corner, move them to, move them to a space that's a bit away from the noise and keep them together. Yeah. I think you could use like a call and response as well to get them, get their attention. If, if you feel like they're not listening, getting distracted. Yeah, and of course you could just ask. They could keep the noise down in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can make your talk quite visual as well so that you're not relying entirely on people hearing your voice. If, uh, if you can get words up on the screen or something like that, then at least you know they might be catching some of it, pictures. Mm -hmm. Good. Good, well, that's got us talking, thinking it anyway. Thank you. We're going to think next about using the space a bit and, and using levels. Now, one of the things I mentioned that annoys me uh, when I'm watching speakers is when they pace up and down like this, and they go backwards and forwards, but for no particular reason. It can be distracting if movement's used in a, in a bad way, but movement used in a good way can be really engaging. So I put there that movement should be intentional, should be purposeful. So for example, stand still, stand strong, as my drama teacher used to say, speak over this way, use your body as your visual aid, nice and energetic. But then when you do want to move, you can move over to speak to another segment of the, the children, speak to this half of the room, but then when you're over here, stand still, stand strong, rather than kind of pacing about, not really thinking about where you're moving or how often you're moving. Try to be purposeful in your movement. Uh, then thinking about use of levels, I always think this can be quite powerful because when you're up here and the children are sat on the floor, already you've, you're making them look up like that but that can be helpful sometimes so that all of the children can see you at the back in a, in a large room, in a large group. But sometimes you might want to just bring it down to a whisper and you can crouch down. You won't be able to see me if I do that. Down here. <laughs> but you can crouch down, kneel down sometimes, talk much more softly. And that brings the atmosphere in the room down, makes them listen very intently. Intensely, so you can use uh, movement levels in that way. Think about varying your distance. Now, not only is this quite a helpful technique for re-engaging somebody who stopped listening to just walking over towards them and suddenly they're listening again, 
But it also is quite a good way of, it's quite imposing actually, particularly if you're preaching from behind a lectern or something, it's a bit like a barrier. And I think the preacher feels a bit safe because they've got something to hold on to. And the, the congregation or the audience, they feel safe because they think you're at a safe distance to them. But you'll be surprised maybe at the, the power of stepping out from behind the lectern or the stand or whatever you're using and suddenly going nearer to people. Suddenly, not only are people more alert because oh, the speaker's coming near me and they think, oh no, they're invading my space. But it, it heightens uh, the, the intensity, I suppose, because suddenly they're, they're much more nearer the action. So if you want to really bring people in or heighten the kind of intensity of a talk, step out, step nearer to your audience. And that's very powerful. The last thing in this little bit is incorporating movement into the story. So could you, not just you as a speaker move, but can you get the children moving? Because that will really engage them. It might just be, stand up and do an action might be getting them to wave or respond to something in the talk it may be even using the whole space so let's go and visit <coughs> jericho everybody so up we get and we're all gonna go and walk around the uh around the walls seven times on the seventh day that sort of thing so trying to use movement for the children as well whether it be actions or yeah something like that or something bigger. There we are. Think about how you use your body and movement in the talk. All right. Okay. So now we're going to talk about how we use visual aids well. Um, so uh, at the very beginning, I obviously had too many visual aids and I didn't really know when to use them and I was dropping them. You want to choose how many you use wisely. You don't want to have too many that's a distraction. Um, also, are your pictures big enough? If you're doing an assembly to 200 kids, you probably don't want to have a little A4 piece of paper. You want to have a nice big A3 piece of paper so that the kids can see it. Uh, you don't want the kids squinting, trying to see what the images are. You want them to be able to see them easily. Let's see what else. Also, when you're thinking about props, you want to be thinking, are the kids going to want to are they going to be tempted to play with them? Are they going to see them at the front of this, at the front, and want to come and play with them? I remember uh, when I was in one of my teaching classes, when I was training, and I, for a practice lesson, brought in some balloons, and I thought, oh, this will be a fun activity for maths. And actually, it was a terrible idea. Uh, my professor said, oh, the kids are just going to start playing with them. Uh, and I definitely know that would be the case they would definitely come up and start playing with them. So really think through what props you bring in. Will the kids be tempted to come on up and play with them? And then use intrigue. So sometimes it's really helpful, especially when I'm teaching younger kids, but I think it works for every age uh, to maybe put an object in a bag or put something in a bag so that the kids are starting to think, what's in there? What's in the bag? And you're teaching through, you're teaching the passage and the kids are thinking, what's in there? What's in there? And you're just getting them to try and uh, guess what it is as you speak. And it's just keeping their attention. Yeah, over to you, Ash. Great. Uh, this se next section is about being dramatic. So I said to Alice, please, can I do that a bit? Because <laughs> I love drama. But it is hard to teach the, the art of holding people's attention. Partly, I think it's about confidence. I've kind of said you need to be bold. But I think lots of it is, is feeling confident in yourself in front of other people. Because people read that. The more you feel like you're confident in what you're doing, as you stand in front of people, you will command their attention, as I put there. We all probably had teachers at school. You know, I remember one could just step in front of the whole assembly hall, hundreds of children, and he didn't need to say anything. But the whole hall would just fall silent without him saying anything. And it wasn't, I think, just because he was strict. It's just because he stood there with such confidence 
but his his body um, posture suggested that he knew we were just going to stop and listen to him. And I think there's something in that. Whereas if you sort of uh, look embarrassed and you're not kind of asserting yourself, then people will be less inclined to listen. So that's the first one. Be confident, be bold in what you're doing. That doesn't necessarily mean loud when I say bold. I don't mean sort of shout there. But even if you're nervous, try not to make a thing of that. I think people that start by saying, I'm really nervous, so please forgive me. It's not the best way to start because it, it lessens people's confidence in you as a speaker. Even if you are nervous, try to um, cover that up, I suppose, rather than going for the sympathy boat of, bear with me because I'm nervous. Uh, people will always be on your side anyway. I think an audience always wants the speaker to do well. They're not looking for you to fail. The next thing is hold their interest. And Alice will kind of pick up on this a little bit more, but I think look at your audience and check if you're holding their interest. And if you're not, then this is when you need to be ready to be flexible and change gears. If I suddenly notice that I'm losing some of my audience, I can see they're fiddling with something else or looking around, looking distracted, then I know that I've become a bit boring. So, as I say in my next point, maybe you just need to vary your voice for a little bit because just taking it up into a different range suddenly brings you down and brings your interest back in with the silence. So just a bit of variety goes a long way, whether that be turning it into a whisper so that people want to listen. Or suddenly speeding things up because they were racing towards the Red Sea and then the Egyptians are behind them and suddenly you can feel the intensity. So those contrasts really bring people back in. So if you feel you're losing your audience, just mix it up a little bit. Use those levels, use your voice. It doesn't have to be something radical. Could even be just getting people to stand up, shake it off and re-engage them again. Um, then I put comedy needs conviction. Uh, Alice did very well with that, but I think that's the sort of example of how something can, um, we can feel the awkwardness of it. And because we feel awkward about it, our audience starts to feel awkward about it. Uh, particularly something that we think is embarrassing. If you're going to do something that's going to be funny, you have to do it with conviction. You have to go all out and not sort of hold anything back. If you've got a funny scene that with a frying pan or something like that, and you've got to make a big mess, and the whole point of it is you're not following the recipe or something like that, you can't, it, it's not going to work if you just half do it. You have to go all in and do it with conviction. Now, I mentioned varying the volume and the pitch, but what, one thing to add is, if that doesn't come naturally to you at first, then what you could do is just put little notes in your column to say, go loud here, whisper, faster. It's like, just like musical directions, really. Build those into your script so that as you're going through, you remember that at this point, you're going to kneel and whisper. And at this point, you're going to really pick up the pace and pick up your uh, volume so that children get excited and feel the excitement at that point of the story, whatever it might be. But just until it comes naturally, you could plan that in. I've put here, your body is your greatest visual aid. Well, lots of what Alice was doing was overly complicated. But sometimes we can spend hours preparing visual aids that perhaps are not necessary, where sometimes you can do something just using your body using your hands to make a do, something like that, something very simple, or the waves. And that doesn't take any preparation, but it's engaging. It can be big, it can be small. So really think about how you're using your body. Uh, even things that are just really simple. You know, you can grab something, an ordinary sheet of paper, 
I'd say, and the sails were blowing. It doesn't have to be particularly complicated. Sometimes I think we overcomplicate it. We did mention earlier though, but be careful if you've got annoying gestures. One thing that you could do, picking up on Alice's section, is perhaps record yourself one time and you'll work out some of your annoying habits, whether you, you use um too many times or whether you're a person that stands maybe with your hands in, in, in doing distracting things, uh, somebody that's a tapper. You know, keep tapping on the lectern all the way through or whatever it might be. Those little annoying habits that we don't know are there, but you'll pick them up by either getting someone to feed back to you and say, can you just, you know, one time, can you critique my talk and let me know if I do anything or perhaps record yourself. And then that's when you realize, oh, I do that. I didn't realize I did that. The last one in, in my drama is pace. I mentioned speeding up and slowing down. And they can both have difficulties because going too slow for too long can be too boring as Alice showed quite well in that talk, as it got very monotone and slow and it got very boring. Equally, it, going too fast, it can be hard to understand people, particularly if your voice isn't uh, particularly clear or your accent or your diction or whatever isn't as clear, and then people can't work out what you're saying. But in a big space like this, I can hear my voice reverberating around and I know that if I go too fast, that the echo will actually start to confuse people because it will become a bit blurry. That's why in churches, generally, people speak a lot slower. We're going to do an exercise, I think, in a little while about projecting your voice. And actually, it's great to practice in a room like this. Because when you hear it come back, then you know that your voice is loud enough. But that's also a good test of whether you're going too fast. Because if you've given it time for the echo to come back to you, then you know that your voice is clear. There's a little top tip there. Just be aware, though, that if you're nervous, you'll probably be more inclined to go fast. Because all you want to do is get the talk over it. And so you persuade them go this, this sort of pace, just as Karen go, oh, good, it's done now. So deliberately try and slow down and take your time. Uh, but, but not too much, <laughs> otherwise you'll get people bored. Just it's the Goldilocks syndrome, you want to go just right. All right, so now we're going to be talking about relating to your audience. So remember your prep, remember the, t the kids that you have in your ministry or in your school or whatever setting you're in. You're the one that knows them best. So as there's a reason we don't just use a teaching video every week without teaching them as well, uh, because we know the kids, therefore we can actually apply it to them best. Uh, we know the kids who <coughs> struggle at school. We know the kids who are involved in sports, who are involved in music. Uh, maybe we have relationships with the parents and we know things about those kids that way. We know them, therefore, we need to apply it to them. And then let's make our talks interactive. So maybe when we were doing the Exit Egypt June Sunday Gang series, we used Exit and then the kids would say Egypt. And so you say Exit, Egypt, and it would keep bring back the kids' attention. Uh, right now in all age services, we're doing all these different talks about praise in throughout scripture, ways, uh, different parts of scripture that talk about praising God and so whenever I say hallelujah everyone says praise the Lord and again it people it brings back focus so it's a really good way of making sure the kids are remembering what we're doing and also keeping their attention another thing that's really really helpful is if you see a child that's distracted maybe just say their name so so there's little Jimmy who's just looking, staring out into space or is just, I don't know, distracted by something to just in the middle of your talk to say, Jimmy, and then continue talking. And it should uh, bring them back, hopefully. And also you can say their name, perhaps you're talking about, I don't know, 
you're talking about something, an illustration that has something to do with some, some activity that a child does in the room. And so maybe to say, oh yeah, like uh, Izzy, like, oh, I know you enjoy playing that sport and you can kind of bring them in and you can ask them what they, their experience of that activity has been, just really making them know that you're teaching them, not just anyone. I think that's important. Eye contact as well is really important. Like if, if you're reading a script the whole time, it's just gonna be less engaging and the kids aren't gonna think that what you have to share is important. But if you're talking to them, they're gonna think, oh, you've got something worth sharing with me. And then also another thing is that if you are looking at your notes, you're not gonna notice the child that's messing around and chatting to someone else in the side of, in the side, on the side. So if you're not, if you know you talk well enough, then you're gonna be able to notice what children are doing and be able to make sure that they're paying attention. Cause there's no point continuing your talk if the children aren't listening. So perhaps it's too hot in the room and you need to just open a window because the kids just can't focus because it's too hot. Or maybe they're just bored and you need to change up the way you speak or change up what you're doing. You need to get them to stand up and shake about a bit. Uh, yeah, so it's really good to have eye contact to notice those different things. Well, what we're gonna do now is I think we're gonna try some of these things out. We're gonna try and do some exercises and Ash is gonna tell us what we're doing. Yes, we've got three different exercises that you can have a go at. Some of these are going to be easier to do on Zoom or at home if you're watching this and recording than others. But we'd like you to have a go at either practicing, uh, demonstrating your passion and energy for something, because it's that passion and energy that your audience will feed off as you're talking. If you're talking monotone, flat, then that's when people switch off. But it's energy that keeps people engaged. So a good way of doing that is maybe persuade us to be excited about a hobby or pastime of yours. If you really enjoy tennis, tell us why it's so fantastic. And then note as you do that, how are you doing that? What sort of techniques are you using to be persuasive or show your enthusiasm? And how could you transfer that into your talks? Were you, were you really in get looking in someone's eyes and saying, it's so great because, whatever it is, uh, how are you using it? Even as I did that, I thought really appealed to Alice like that, using my hands. I had eye contact. I was trying to draw it in. I raised the tone of my voice a little bit. I sounded excited. So just note things like that as an alternative. Tell us the funniest thing that's ever happened to you or describe a cause that you're passionate about and why it matters so much to you. So that's that one, thinking about your energy, your passion as you speak. Then one that I enjoy doing is voice projection and vocal technique. Because even today, I went to a school assembly to, to watch uh, some children leading the assembly. And I sat at the back and we could barely hear them. And you think, now this is interesting because children out in the playground, they all know how to be loud, but put them in front of a, an assembly full of people and suddenly they forget how to be loud. But this is one actually lots of people struggle with, getting their voice to really travel. It's different from shouting. You can feel it here in your diaphragm if you're using your voice properly. And we were talking about earlier getting the right pitch. So you, for, for men, you want to be in the top part of your range and your voice will travel a lot further. If I go down to the bottom part of my range, it doesn't travel as well. If I just, if I'm talking to Alice, then I'll talk something like this. Whereas if I really take it up to the top part of my range, my voice will travel a lot further and I can clearly hear that my voice is bouncing off the wall at the end and coming back to me. That's projecting your voice. You can feel it's forceful from here. So there's a difference. But an exercise that you could have a go at for that is get somebody else to stand a long way away and see if they can hear you. Or in a crowded room where you're all doing the same exercise, this is fun, you could workshop it with your teams. Get everybody to do it at the same time in pairs. One other end of the hall and see if they can be heard by the other end. 
So it's not shouting, you'll get, a, you'll get a sore throat if you do that. Projecting your voice is much more sustainable. The last one is memorization and recall. So we've put a little passage here, which we thought was a bit of an obscure Bible story that you might not come across many times. And you've got to just look at it briefly now and then see if you can retell the story in your own words, but as you know, faithful to the text. Because what we want you to improve here is your ability to work without notes and show you that it can be done. You can look at a story, remember the main points of it, put your paper down and tell the story, making sure you work through those main points. So there are three little exercises. I suggest the people on Zoom perhaps have a go at, at number three, or perhaps number one. Three, I think, is probably the easiest one to do on Zoom. And uh, we'll probably cut the recording off here. So thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're watching at another point, we hope that's been helpful. Go and have fun, everybody. <laughs>